and this is what no one would expect. Yeah. Arabia as unified, which before totally tribal, and as and these in these massive invasion force pours out. And by the six fifties, the Middle East, all of it's under Islamic control. And then by the seven fifties, the dominant power for really the next probably millennia almost is Islam. Welcome to Classical Etc a show that dives into the philosophy, culture, and heart of classical education. You're in the studio with Shane Saxon. Hello, my name's Shane Saxon, and this is Classical Etc. Today, I sat down with Dustin Warren, a high school history teacher at Highlands Latin School, and we discussed his top five moments that are forgotten about in mid the Middle Ages that help us to understand our current cultural moment. If you like this video and want to show us some support, then you can like the video or drop us a comment in the comment section. Without further ado, let's jump in. The Dark Ages. Were they really dark, Dustin? <sighs> Difficult question to answer. Don't answer it yet. Yeah. Uh, in classical education, we talk so much about the Middle Ages, you know, because in a lot of ways, what we're doing is reviving a form of education that was maybe at its peak in terms of formal institutions mm. in the Middle Ages. And yet the reality is that there was shorter lifespans in the Middle Ages, shorter less literacy, um, poverty, sickness, lack of awareness in Western cultures of Eastern cultures, you know, all of these different things that now are different that have mm. changed, evolved, some for the better, some for the worse. But you told me before that talking about the dark ages is something that's interesting as a high school teacher of history and maybe perhaps more interesting in a classical setting. Mm. Why did you, why did you say that? Uh, why well, it's maybe more interesting in a classical setting. Yeah. Yeah, so one of the fun things about medieval history is no one usually knows anything about it. So it's just completely everything they usually hear or learn. Like if they have any conception, it's usually something like Black Plague, rats, something probably grotesque, um, which I don't want to, you know, harm any listeners' ears or somebody young nearby. We already had Mr. Dennis, so it'd be oh, hard to okay. get worse. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, just... <laughs> tortures i mean things like that and usually it's like something really dark they know like some guy named charlemagne right um but they don't know anything else about him um there's just a lot of just emptiness basically sure um aside from maybe the literature they read so it's really like it sometimes feel like you're like walking um like like walking a child or, or seeing a child take its first steps and kind of showing them how to walk because they just don't know anything and there's yeah. so many things that ha has happened in medieval history that they don't even know the connections of today. So many things happen. It's like, I always think of it like this. It's like, like as an American, um, I feel like I have this opportunity. It's like, let's say, you know, an, the average American like knows there was a George Washington and he chopped down a cherry tree, um, which of course we all know, you know, maybe not exactly true. Uh, but he chops down a cherry tree and the revolution. And then we know there was like a vague civil war and some guy named Lincoln who had a big hat and, you know, got a beard because a, a, a little girl supposedly made fun of him. Um, Which is not a bad that. reason to grow up. Yeah, beard. I mean, no. I mean, that's why the goatee. Sure. Uh, yeah. Hides the, you know, lack of a good chin. Um, but then they know like, well, obviously they know World War II, right? Because, I mean. There's a lot of movies about it. Yeah. Back to back world champs. Um, but that's it. If that's if that's all I know about American. I mean, there's so many things that's happened aside from that. Um, you, can you really understand American history if you just know like these random little tidbits? And I said like the average American, and probably honestly, a lot of times that is a lot of Americans' experience, whether mm -hmm. it's bad history class or a bad teacher or, or whatever or else you have. And you think about like Western civilization on a grander scale. Um, if you think like, oh, well, that person knows that little about American history, they don't understand anything about America. They don't have any idea what's going on and why things are happening. How much more so if you back up in sure. the grand scale um, of human history, if like medieval is just blank. Yeah. So for me, it's like I get this great joy of of showing them this great middle they don't know. Yeah. Um, does that make sense? Oh, hundred percent. I, I was thinking while it's like you were saying that. It's like revelation and nothing else. It's like, what, <laughs> what's going on? You know? Yeah. That's right. I like, I like you call it the great middle. Maybe that'd be a better name than the dark ages. The yeah, great middle. Yeah. Dark, dark ages has a strong connotation. A lot yeah. of the times I'm talking to educators who mm -hmm. are frustrated that their students don't have enough American history and mm -hmm. they're looking yeah. around and they're saying, man, things are weird in America right now. And if they just knew more about the founding fathers, if they knew about mm -hmm. what brought us here, then maybe we could solve some of these issues. And I, the countercultural message that I'm trying to say is mm -hmm. 
go farther back, reach deeper. Mm -hmm. What is it about the glorious revolution that led to the founding fathers? Mm -hmm. You know, what is it about other events in the Carolingian dynasty and the Renaissance there that led to expansions into Europe in the way that they think about political philosophy that have brought us to the point we're in? That's where the breadth that our students need mm -hmm. if we're really going to cultivate good citizens. So if you're looking at the great middle, the dark ages, middle ages, what are maybe four or five events that you think everyone should be familiar with if they're going to be a more well-rounded mm -hmm. person? I think one, um, and this might be slightly controversial, so I'll say it. Um, obviously, I think 476 is a big date. Mm. This will start off right off of the bat. Because it's the fall of Rome, mm -hmm. which in class, like we go through in class in that. And I kind of put a question mark there because, and this is something like with history all the time, it's always, I feel like a lot of it's clarifying misconceptions mm -hmm. because uh, oftentimes you have generalizations and they're needed, right? You can't, you know, like you say in World War II, if you say the British were against the Nazis, that's true. And as a generalization, you know, but there is, of course, there's some who may not have, you know, they were pro Nazi or they were you know, pacifists or whatever, of course, but generalizations are made and that's okay. But sometimes the generalizations can take on a more nefarious character. Sure. Um, or maybe it's not a full picture of it. So like with like Rome in 476, we walk through and look at how sources and other stuff, like it did fall. It's true. I mean, power is changing, but also Rome's been changing for a while. Mm. I mean, the barbarians, the Goths, other groups had become well integrated into the empire in different positions. Um, Romans have been adopting barbarian culture. You can read sources about how older Romans were freaking out because um, uh, younger Romans were like growing their hair longer. Right. And, you know, I guess looking like 60s hippies or yeah. uh, 70s rock band <laughs> um, or a modern rock band too. And that was really weirding them out, which the kids see is like, oh, well, that's, they can think of stuff like that. Things like that happen now. Um, but it is, it is, we will see like it is falling, but. It's also not exactly like the Romans didn't just, um, it's something true to civilization. Civilizations don't just snap and everything's different. Like the Roman, Rome fell to the barbarians, but in many ways a barbarian was replacing another barbarian, mm -hmm. exchanging power. And the Romans didn't like, you know, um, rip off all their togas, jokingly, of course, rip off all whatever, all the things and the marble all was destroyed. And then they're speaking, you know, barbarian or speaking Fr or old Frank or whatever. They're still speaking Latin. It's still going on for centuries afterwards. Um, and that kind of, to them, it's like, oh, it's not just, because, you know, the younger kid, you hear Rome fell in 476, which isn't false. But then you find like, oh, there's a lot more to that story. And you see like the change of society and how it's not a quick, easy thing. Mm -hmm. And to them, I think that's the first thing is seen. And also to them knowing as well, that in the West things are declining, but in the East, it's I think it's the complete opposite in many ways. Um, and that's a story we trace too is Eastern Roman Empire as well. Yeah. What we often call the Byzantine um, Empire, which they would hate <laughs> and be so mad about, but that's maybe we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, so that's the first one. You wanted five, right? Yeah. So right. I mean, that's yeah, a great yeah. one because I think so many people as kids, I, I can imagine myself thinking, well, I wonder if the U.S. just ends at some point. And yeah, the reality yeah. is, is that there are forces at play every day yes. in every community on every election cycle that are either bringing us upward or bringing us downward and leading in mm -hmm. some direction that could eventually, eventually be put in the in the in the yearbook as the fall of the United States or something like that. Yeah. So yeah. what's the second one? Second one, um, I would say after that, to me. Hmm. I'm trying to think which one I'm going to go with first because they're both pretty close to each other. I would say I think the next big one is probably the birth of Muhammad. Hmm. Um, we do unit five. We do a unit on Islam. And what's fascinating is if you were like living, you know, in the five, six hundreds, um, historians always like, always like to play the game. And, you know, amateur history teachers too, amateur historians. We always like to play the game of let's say we're like we don't know the future we just we're in 500s and we're like that's all we know who do we think is going to be top top dog or the next big players and if you're living in the middle east or turkey or constantinople probably in the west too um you're not thinking like the byzantine empire is going to decline rapidly anytime soon mm -hmm. i mean the 500s and just in through Justinian's reign, empire conquered some lands in the West. It was having some financial uh, problems due to those conquests and some other issues going on, but it was a, the mightiest empire there. And 
then and this is what I always ask the kids. We we'll go right after Justinian a few decades later. There's this emperor named Heraclius. Have you ever heard of Heraclius? No. And I didn't either until further study. Um, and he's this amazing emperor because he comes to the throne around 611. And the empire by 611 was being invaded from three different spots. There was the uh, Lombards in Italy. And that was turned into a very Vietnam quagmire situation where it was a long drawn out war. Like you read about Pope Gregory the Great. Mm. And now he steps in and tries to help the citizens because Rome's like starving and this Italy's on fire. It's because the Lombards. They didn't like Christians. Um, they wanted to burn down Rome and kill all of them. Um, but they're invading there. Then there's this tribe called the Avars. It's horse-based tribe. Um, you can call them Hunnic wannabes, I guess. And they're coming in through Greece. And then to the east, the Sassanids, the Sassanid Persian Empire, which had replaced the Parthians, which had replaced the other Persians in that long story. Um, they were invading from the east. And probably the Avars were being paid by the Sassanids to invade. So there's like this all corners, west, north. Uh, north, east, all around, Rome's getting hit. And when Heraclius comes to the throne, around 610, 611, the empire's like hanging on by a thread, mm -hmm. basically. And then he spends years rebuilding the army, dealing with other issues. There's a whole religious controversy going on with St. Saint, uh, Maximus the Confessor. Um, but I won't, I'm trying to resist going off on a tangent about him. He's a fascinating guy. And he does this one thing which no Roman emperor had ever done is that he takes, and in some ways it's almost like a crusade because he it start this, the campaign starts off with him preaching in the Hagia Sophia mm -hmm. um, right after Easter and saying that we're going forth for the Lord. And he goes and, well, first he goes and burns down their temple in Azer, modern day Azerbaijan because they burnt down Jerusalem's churches and Alexandria. So that, that world, once again, there's that religious politicals combined. There's no separation, which the kids are always really confused by. Like, he went and burned down their temple? Yeah. They're thinking, what about the Geneva Convention? There's no <laughs> Geneva Convention. Uh, there's no, it does not exist. But he then does the one thing that no Roman emperor has ever done, which is he conquers the East. Mm -hmm. Augustus, Trajan, uh, Julian the Apostate, they've attempted things. But no one ever subdued in a strong way. Yeah. And Heraclius did. He conquered the East. Sure. I mean, Crassus tried. And they, you know, one story says, um, debated, of course, if it's true. But, you know, the Parthians poured molten gold down his throat because he was the richest guy. The East always has a funny sense of humor with torture, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of things they do. But he does that. And it's this amazing victory. He bring, and supposedly the true cross was taken there. And he brings it back. And he comes back to Constantinople. And everyone's excited. They've defeated, you know, what they see as their enemy. And that's around the 630s and then on the horizon. And this is what no one would expect. Yeah. Arabia as unified, which before totally tribal and as in these, in these massive invasion force pours out. And by the 650s, the Middle East, um, East going beyond modern day, Af including close to Afghanistan, North Africa, all of it's under Islamic control. Mm. And then by the 750s, the dominant power for really the next probably millennia almost, is Islam, yeah. the Islamic Caliphate. And if you're a historian, that would be like the equivalent of Greenland invading us with, I don't know, maybe there's 10,000 people in Greenland, 20, like an, I always tell the kids, like a, imagine like an army of seals, Greenland Greenlanders riding seals come and invade America. That's how ludicrous mm. it would be if Islam, because it was just, no one in that time looked down upon it. It was just this nothing land. Sounds like a trite example for this could be if Patrick Mahomes, who has been the MVP and the best uh, quarterback in the NFL, yes. and is so young and looks like he's going to win the Super Bowl every year for the next 20 years, yeah. if someone else came out of, into the league who was better yes. next year, and yeah, he yeah. was the one who did it for 20 years. Yes, it'd be just like that, <laughs> which is how I felt the past uh, decade with the 49ers. There it's like go. right there and every time something bad happens. <laughs> uh, the 80s were a great decade, not so much anymore. But but yeah, no one expected it. And understand, and then Islam's, a, and this is something we forget because, you know, we're Westerners and mm -hmm. a lot of our ancestry is from Western Europe. But Islam, there's so much that goes on, the influence that they have. I mean, they're in the 750s invading China, for goodness sake. I mean, they're going everywhere. I mean, their empire probably... Aside from maybe Genghis Khan and a few others, their empire expands so rapidly across the world. I mean, they're in Spain, 711. Mm -hmm. They're invading France in the 740s. And there's so much learning. And um, I, I could I'm trying to be, on, be about time, but so many things Islamic Empire does that's just been forgotten or neglected, and or just their story of the craziness of that yeah. surprise, because that's why we don't know who Heraclius is. Mm. No one cares because what happens? He has a nervous breakdown because it's like, imagine, you know, let's say Mahomes goes and wins the Super Bowl this year 
And then, you know, right afterwards, the whole team just gets massacred. And you know, imagine all 31 NFL, other NFL teams come up and beat them all up. And that's that's how their year ends. Like, it's just, it's, the, it's like, I just got done with this game and I've got to do this. And this thing's happened to me. Or maybe like 31 NFL games they got to play now or something like that. Every, it's every other team. But it was just atrocious for, for Heraclius and the Empire. That's why no one knows them. Now, the, the third thing, and this is maybe slightly cheating a little bit, but I just, I just, I can't help myself. So I mentioned the Byzantines and I mentioned them and I mentioned the context of Islam coming, but a part of me would say just most important, maybe a date is just that, that flourishing of the Byzantine empire, which is occurring from, I'd say the, probably the rise of Constantine or at least Emperor Theodosius the Great in the late 390s into Justinian's reign because there's so much as I've learned and studied. And it's just because, you know, we think when we think the West, really we think England, France, Germany, Spain. It's, right. it's natural because, you know, the um, majority of the ethnicities and populations in America, of course. But there's a lot of wonderful things that the East did. I mean, for one, I mean, historians have argued this a lot. One thing these things did was that they, I mean, held off the, um, from the Eastern side at least, the Islamic invasions and helped to preserve. Um, uh, I mean, Southeastern Europe, maybe Central Europe, from becoming under the under the rule of a foreign power. So there's that big aspect of them like holding the line forever. But then, like you look into their the conventions. I mean, every day probably something the Byzantines gave you, Eastern Romans, is a fork. Um, we think the fork was invented by them in the 300s. So every I mean, kids, it's like something we point out. I have this picture of a fork and then a mosque. And then they're always really confused because it's like, this has nothing to do with each other, but it does because these are both things that they gave us. So like the fork, um, you see Islamic architecture, like the mosque mm -hmm. that we often see, um, the Byzantines, the Hagia Sophia, the church that they built with the pendant of dome and, and of course the, the main dome at the top, um, that, that, that architectural style, Islam adopted it in many ways and some other reasons too, but many ways because, well, you see the Hagia Sophia yeah. and you want that city and you copy it. Um, and a lot of times I think, oh, I thought that was just native. It's like, well, it's been adopted and incorporated in many ways. Um, but then we go into like other aspects and the state run hospitals. Um, this kind of comes in with the church too, but the Byzantines started some of the first like widely ran state run hospitals, hmm. especially in Constantinople, where they had wings for men, women, poor, orphans, diseases. Um, it's a Christian legacy in many ways when we see state run hospitals. And then you could go on to, I mean, the fashion industry, the silks. Um, there's a famous like silk industry in many ways got bumped up by the Byzantines. Uh, I remember a couple Byzantines famously smuggled out under penalty of death from China, a couple of silkworms. That's how it became more popular in England and even in the France and so on. Um, you can go on and on. I mean, academic learning, the classical education was kept alive in Constantinople, which was helpful later, which we'll, I'm probably going to ramble about in a little bit. And there's just there's just so much in the East that they did. Why do you, why do you think that the Byzantine that? Empire is just not talked about very much in most schools? Yeah, what some of those reasons? I think, and that's what I that's the thing I felt super lied to. Um, is like there's a famous there's a history book called Lies My Teacher Told Me, yeah. which is a great book. Uh, it's fan, we read it in college, but I remember like reading the textbook as a kid, flipping pages because I was bored in class and I'd done a packet. It wasn't a good class, obviously, but we just did a packet all the time. I got bored. I was flipping a page and I saw like the fall of Rome. And it's like this picture of like its city is on fire and there's barbarians everywhere. It looks like something out of like Dante's Inferno. And I was like, oh my gosh, I fell. And then later in life, I was like, wait, well, it did, but it kept going in the East. And I think part of it, honestly, is just, it's just normal in that we focus on what's closest and familiar and we cut things that aren't as close. So I think part of it's just that natural bias. Right. Um, now some of it though, if you get dig and like the con like conceptions of a dark age, you asked in the beginning, um, a lot of that's also like medi, like, um, enlightenment era historians, um, like I forget the name of the historian, maybe here and here, Namos Wolf, but that sounds almost too German, but he coined the term really Byzantine as a, as a word to apply to them. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to call them Roman. Um, the Enlightenment really looked down upon the Byzantines. And some of that goes back also to the Crusades because the Crusaders did not like the Byzantines as well um, for issues that we'll get into in a little bit. But I, th I think the natural yeah. now level is just, it's not close to us. But then sure. there's other things if you dig, other threads of animosity there mm. as well. Yeah, so they're obviously very important in preserving a lot of things. But yes. then 
the fall of Constantinople yes. is a domino effect for even the founding of or the discovery of the new world, right? Yeah, so many things. Um, but but the, we'll get there when we get okay. there. Okay, sorry. Uh, the no, 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 that's good. That's my fifth one. You're reading my mind. No, the fourth one. So after that, uh, we're only number four. I would say, this is me cheating again, but I think if you combine the Crusades, especially the first one, with the Schism, you there's so many strands that come out of that mm. to me. So um, the first Crusade by itself, like the event itself is fascinating to, to, to read about and study because you get these men who are literally stumbling their way to victory when you look at their story. But to kind of back up in a big scale with the Crusades, one aspect is really in many ways, it's the the sealer of the Great Schism, which sometimes people say the Great Schism happened in 1054 and that was it. I mean, there was issues before, centuries before between the Western and Eastern Church and the 1054 with the whole episode in Constantinople and this guy named Humbert who came over and uh, I can't get into the length of it, but things didn't go too well. Let's just say it was a really awkward Sunday in the middle of uh, the liturgy, some things that happened. But that was, but the church still kept talking after that. That sometimes seems the great schism, but really what sealed it is during the first crusade, the Byzantines and the Franks and the others are working together, but they feel like they ditched them. We're not getting enough food. They, the army turned away and we're just going to march on our own. And that leads to some, some breakings and mistrust there. And that causes issues. But then by the time you get to the 1200s with the fourth crusade, and the sacking of Constantinople when the Latin crusaders led by a blind doge, um, his name is, and I think Enrico was his name, uh, but I may be wrong, but the doge uh, of Italy, of Venice, he uh, he basically offered his ships, the Venetian Navy offered their ships to transport crusaders to go to Egypt. And instead they made a pit stop at Constantinople mm. and you know, a few crazy things happen. Next thing you know, they've sacked the city. And that did not go well with our Eastern brothers. Um, they're, they, I think even recently, 20 years ago or so, uh, the West, the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church was meeting and uh, I think it was Benedict and they brought that up and talked about it. And they're like, we're still sorry about that, by the way. Um, but there's still, that, that really like sealed a lot of like the group the great schism, which forever has, I mean, God forbid, but forever has led to a split. It was the first split between the West and the East and the Western Eastern church and a divergence in thought and philosophy and government approaches in so many ways. So I, and that's just the crusades on that. And then the time with the schism, but then I'd like another thing too, which I bring out with the kids is this leads into the Renaissance. Mm. Because you think about, okay, crusaders, the Franks, not really good sailors, more about fighting on land. They need somebody to transport them on ships. Who's there to offer it? The Italians, right, the Venetians. Right. And this is how the Venetians and the um, Genoans and others become more wealthy. And they make a lot of money over those centuries. Mm -hmm. And then when you get to the Renaissance, which begins in the 14, late 1300s, and this is why I tell the kids, you don't have golden ages typically unless there's an abundance of wealth. Right. When you're like living day to day and trying to make it, you're not laying on your back on hours on a scaffold painting, you know, um, I, you know, I always look at Michelangelo's paintings. Like if you've ever seen Isaiah, it's like a really buff guy. You know, she's just sitting there like painting like a really buff Isaiah. You don't send there 12, spend there 12 hours a day with all that time. Someone's paying. If they're you. poor, it's a very skinny Isaiah. Yeah, it's a very skinny <laughs> Isaiah. But uh, yeah, yeah, you get you get uh, you get the the well fed people, but you don't do that unless you have wealth. In the Renaissance, the the families, the Medici is the most famous who finance all kinds of guys like Raphael and um, all the other Ninja Turtles. Um, but you don't have that wealth unless there's a crusade. Right. Which if there's not a Renaissance, is there a movement towards? I mean, the Enlightenment, scientific revolution. Exploration, uh, the Reformation, of the new world. exploration, new world, yeah, and that's just like a, the Crusades. It's a, it's a thing. It's that splinters off, or like checking. I mean, the idea of like modern checking and things. The Knights Templar helped with that mm. in developing a system. And checking in terms of like just going to a place that holds your money. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because you often would get robbed, you know, on the way there. So it would be very dangerous to carry cash or well, cash uh, coins or anything else on you. Yeah. So, and that kind of leads into number five. Um, I'm sure there's something else about the Crusades I'm forgetting because there's so much that goes on there. But the last thing to me, um, often forgotten about, which is a very pivotal year, 1453 is an immensely pivotal year because it's both the end of the Hundred Years' War, mm. um, which spelled the end of many things, but maybe for a greater, grander world purposes, it spelled the end of the Byzantine Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, which 
the kids, I keep tell the kids over and over, like, hey, these are the Romans. They're not, they're, you know, they didn't call themselves, you know, the Byzantines. And they're like, I remember like even the last couple weeks in class, we were like halfway through the Byzantine unit. And the kids were like, so wait, this is the Roman Empire in the 800s? Like, yeah, they would say so. And it's still like, it's like, oh, wow. Because you get the 1453, that's a very old empire. Like we're really talking 1500 years mm -hmm. if we would consider the thing contiguous. And there's a couple centuries where some things go wrong, but in the 1200s. But 1453 in May, the empire falls, which is often forgotten about, of course. But when that empire falls and up to its fall, those all those Greek scholars, for instance, um, they need a job right. and a place not to get jailed or something else bad happened to them. A lot of them have been moving already to Italy and they're teaching Greek and reintroducing Greek other Greek ideas. I mean, I've even forgotten teachers, philosophers to the Italian Renaissance. They're basically injecting or, or a good shot of, of Greek, of Greece and Greek and ancient Rome to the Italians. They're helping give like a booster shot for the Renaissance right there. And then also they're bringing over the Greek New Testament mm. and, and, and the access of that is becoming more prevalent. And that's contributing also to Reformation, um, the Protestant Reformation as well, and kicking that off. Like you probably do not have the Renaissance or the Protestant Reformation in the same way that it happened unless Constantinople and the, the East Roman Empire is declining. Sure. Because all of the men coming over um, and then, you, of course, that's another thing, too. You go back for just a second. You go back to the Byzantines in the 700s, the iconoclast controversy, when there was this time, the Eastern Church uses icons a lot, of course. If you've ever been to Orthodox Church, they're, they're everywhere. You walk in, you see the Virgin Mary and, um, and, uh, and uh, the infant Jesus at the front, usually in Christ at the top. It's very much in uh, part of their, uh, their faith. And in the 700s, there was a time where they questioned that and and face Islamic invasions, maybe God's mad at us, maybe he's cursed us because of our icons. It doesn't last. But those arguments in the BCN Empire that are used argue against the icons, argue against those icons. The reformers, whether it's Luther or Calvin or others, a lot of the arguments they're using, they're they, coincidentally or not coincidentally, are a lot of the same ones that the mm. Byzantines were using. Because they're they're getting these sources for the first time and reading yeah, them for the yeah. first time. And, and it's enhancing their arguments or helping spark things. And that's something we talk about with the kids is, so like, you know, if you're like a Protestant, a Protestant student and you go into a church and you don't see a lot of icons or any icons, like this is a connection. Like the connection is not just the Reformation, which a lot of them are like, oh yeah, we don't have icons. They're like, well, we have some stained glass or, and you'll get some who do have some type of religious imagery. But they've never really thought about it. It's like, well, it's not just here. It goes even further back. And seeing that, it makes them realize, and this is the big thing about, I think, medieval, is there's so much complexity and nuance and layers that built up to mm -hmm. the modern world that you can't just get from, oh, it's dark. That yeah. You can't just get from whatever else. Yeah. Well, Dustin, this has been a great conversation. Five things you wouldn't know about the, the great middle. The great middle. And we can do top 10 next time. All right. I've enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you for joining me for this episode of Classical Etc. If you want to show support for the video, then you can hit the thumbs up icon below to give it a like. Or if you want to leave a comment, you can tell me what conversations you'd like me to have in the future. Check out our Memoria Press YouTube channel to find tons of other educational resources. And also a huge thank you to the Memoria Press Podcast Network. This is Classical Etc. And I'll see you next time.